Welcome back to a little bit of philosophy. This is Philosophy 101, Unit 3, Lecture 4, St. Thomas and the Cosmological Argument for God's Existence. Now, in our last video, we examined a version of the ontological argument by St. Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century. We noted that his argument rested on the metaphysics of Plato, even though the actual works of Plato were largely lost to the medieval world. His metaphysics became an essential part of the medieval worldview because it had been popularized in the late Roman period by the philosopher Plotinus, and then synthesized with Christian theology by St. Augustine, the famous church father. Because Augustine's work survived, Plato survived, making his dualistic metaphysics the de facto worldview in the West in the Middle Ages. That is, until the works of Aristotle began making a reappearance in the middle of the 12th century. The rediscovery of Aristotle would fundamentally change how late medieval thinkers conceptualized the world, including how we might give evidence for God's existence. Now, You'll recall that Aristotle was a philosopher of the late classical era of the ancient period of Western intellectual history. He was the most notable student ever to study in Plato's academy in Athens. And after Plato's death, Aristotle left the academy and studied with other philosophers around the greater Greek world, and eventually took up a post in the royal court of Macedonia, where he would become the tutor to Alexander, who was destined on the death of his father to become Alexander the Great. But that's an entirely different story. After Alexander's succession to the throne, Aristotle would return to Athens with Alexander's patronage and establish a school of philosophy in the Lyceum, or Gymnasium, at Athens. But Aristotle's school was not destined to last much longer than his own life due to the political intrigues between Athens and the Macedonian Empire. Aristotle's students, known as the Peripatetics, would largely relocate to other parts of the Hellenistic world, most notably the new city of Alexandria in Egypt, which had been founded by Alexander in 331 BCE. After Aristotle's death, his library was passed to his leading student, Theophrastus, but more about that in a moment. Aristotle's books would largely be lost in the West during the succeeding periods of intellectual history, so that by the time of St. Anselm, there are only a few works of logic that were still available. This is why he was dependent upon Plato's metaphysical view. It was the only one that was available. But in a little more than a hundred years, Aristotle would be rediscovered, and it would fall to St. Thomas of Aquinas to do what St. Augustine had done nearly a thousand years before, synthesize a great Greek philosophical system with Christian theology. But why would the West have to wait so long for an alternative metaphysical theory? What actually happened to Aristotle's works? It's a long and complicated story, and there are a great many gaps in the historical record, but what we know is that Aristotle bequeathed his library to his principal student in the Lyceum, Theophrastus. This would include both his published books, or exoteric work, as well as his personal notes and journals used in teaching in the Lyceum, known as the esoteric works. Upon the death of Theophrastus, the library was passed to one Nellis, who was supposedly attached to the Lyceum in some way. He transported much of the library to his hometown of Skepsis and possibly sold some of the manuscripts for profit. The next historical record we have of Aristotle's works comes 200 years later, when a pelican of Tias purchased the works still in the possession of Nellis' descendants. We don't know exactly how many manuscripts Apelicon purchased, nor exactly which ones were included in that purchase, though it seems likely that Aristotle's published works were no longer part of the collection. 500 years later, the Roman philosopher Boethius translated and wrote commentaries on Aristotle's logical works, collectively known as the Organon, and this seems to be all that survived of Aristotle's works into the Middle Ages.
The Crusades of the late 11th century would revive interest in the lost works of the ancient Greek and Romans, as soldiers would often bring books back from their campaigns to sell to eager monastic libraries to finance their military activities. The rediscovery of these lost works would inspire scholars like James of Venice to travel to Constantinople to find the works of Aristotle which survived in both Greek and Arabic manuscripts. The work of translating these ancient manuscripts was continued by William of Morbeck, who translated many of the works of Aristotle that survived to us into Latin, making them widely available to scholars like St. Thomas of Aquinas. St. Thomas was perhaps the greatest medieval scholar to comment on and popularize the newly rediscovered works of Aristotle, which were initially banned by the church for their anti-Platonic worldview. But Thomas's magnum opus, the Summa Theologica, would eventually win over the skeptics, and the Aristotelian synthesis would come to replace the older Augustinian tradition of Christian philosophy. The Summa Theologica is a massive work, and the arguments for God's existence make up only a small fragment of the first book, but that's what we'll be focusing on. There are five distinct arguments, or proofs of God's existence given by St. Thomas. Each of them is built on an empirical epistemological view derived from Aristotle, so they're conspicuously a posteriori in nature. They can all be framed as a why is there question. We observe motion, but why does motion exist? We observe causation, but why does it exist? We observe that some things in the universe are contingent, but why? The answer to each of these questions, as we'll see, will ultimately be because of God. Now, the first argument, the one that Thomas thinks is the clearest, is the argument from motion. We observe through our senses that things in the world around us move. The second premise tells us that those moving things must have been moved by something else. Now, this, of course, is not directly observable in all cases, so he provides us with a sub-argument to justify this claim. There are two states of motion, actual motion and potential motion. There are things that are actually moving, and there are things that aren't moving, but could be moving. For something at rest, but potentially in motion, an actual thing is required to change the state of potentiality to a state of actuality. It is, of course, impossible for something to be in both states simultaneously. So every moving thing must have been affected by some actual thing that changed its state from potentiality to actuality, from potential motion to actual motion. Hence, nothing moves itself. Thomas proceeds then to claim that it would be impossible to have an infinite chain of movers or an infinite regression of motion. Therefore, we arrive at a first mover, which will be the thing which sets all actual motion in motion. But it, of course, itself, because it's the first, will not be moving. This first unmoved mover is what we call God. Now, it's important to note that at this point, Thomas has not established any of the other metaphysical properties of God, such as omnipotence or omniscience. He's just pointing out that whatever it is that set the chain of motion into effect is whatever God turns out to be. Now, to evaluate this argument, let's grant, for the sake of argument, that it's valid. So, we would need to look to the premises to evaluate them for their truth value. The first premise seems to be unassailable, so long as we ignore the Parmenidean view that there's no change at all in the universe. From a purely observational point of view, things do seem to change their location in space. If we grant the sub-argument he's given us for premise two, we'll see that it's okay as well. But what about this third premise? Why is it impossible to have an infinite backward chain of movers? Why must there be a first mover? If we look at what he says as justification for the premise, we see that it, in some sense, depends on how we count things. 
Let's let this number line represent a set of movements in the universe. And for argument's sake, let's start with the third motion, which, as we know, must have been caused by the second. But as this must be in motion as well, it will be preceded by the first. When we reach the first, we know, by definition, that there cannot be anything prior to it, because it is the first, and that's what it means to be first. But there seems to be something suspicious going on here. If we conceive of a number line that is infinite in both directions, when we arbitrarily pick a motion and start counting backwards, we don't have to stop when we reach one. But St. Thomas did. Zero and negative numbers were among the new ideas making their way into Europe from the East at the same time as Aristotle's texts. And it's not clear exactly how much Thomas understood about the concept of zero as a real number. But it's certainly the case that number lines as a tool for visualizing whole numbers would not exist in Europe for another 300 years. So when Thomas counts backward, he had to stop at the number one because it was the first number. But we today would distinguish between the concept of something being first and the number one. They're not the same idea. So what it would seem that premise three turns on an ambiguity between these two concepts, the ambiguity between the concept of the number one and the concept of something's being first. And that would be sufficient for us to claim that the premise is false. So if the argument is valid, it would still turn out to be unsound, so long as premise three is false. But perhaps the problem isn't with numbers, perhaps it's actually a temporal idea. Thinking about it in this way, we can see that the assumption would be that time has a beginning and then moves infinitely forward. But why should that be the case? If time were infinite, as many ancient and Hellenistic Greek philosophers held, there would be no reason to think of it as having a beginning. Or we could think of time as being a circle instead of a line. If time were cyclical, there would always be a something prior, and there would be no first. Wherever we start looking on the cycle would be the beginning, but it certainly wouldn't be the first thing on the circle. There's one final objection we can note in this argument, and that comes in the conclusion. Note how Thomas concludes that there must be a first mover, singular. But why should that follow from the argument? Isn't it possible to have two movers of an object? And if so, why not three? Or why not four? Why not an infinite number of movers? The point is that the premises of the argument don't force us to conclude that there is only one first mover. And hence, it would be an unwarranted assumption to conclude that there is only one. Of course, that doesn't mean that there is more than one, only that it's possible. And therefore, he's making an unjustified inference to the existence of only one first mover in the conclusion. Now, the second argument for God's existence is the argument from causation. You probably noticed while you were reading it that it's remarkably like the first argument. In fact, it's basically the same argument with the substitution of efficient cause for mover. So the first premise tells us that part of what we observe in the universe is a set of effects, and that all of these effects have an efficient cause. Now, we'll get to the concept of efficient causation in just a moment, but first let's remind ourselves of something we covered in the introduction to metaphysics. For the moment, let's suspend any skepticism we have regarding the world corresponding to our sensory experience of it. There are events which occur in the universe, and we can observe at least some of these events. These events are either preceded by a cause, or they are not preceded by a cause. If they are preceded by a cause, the events we observe can be labeled effects, the byproduct of the events that preceded them. Since Thomas states that all material events are effects, we know that he rejects the idea that there are truly random events that occur. Things don't just happen. In fact, he's telling us that 
every material event in the world happens for a reason, and that reason is the cause or set of causes that preceded the effect. So for any observable event, we can reasonably ask, why is that happening? And the answer will lie in the connection between what we observe and what preceded what we observe. Now, all of this is pretty much common sense, and I belabor the point just to make it clear that there's no magic involved here. Everything happens for a reason, and if we understand the nature of causation, we will understand the reason for what we observe. Now that we more clearly understand that every event is preceded by a cause, we can focus on the nature of causation itself. Here we find the influence of Aristotle on St. Thomas. Aristotle's theory of causation is found in Book 2 of the Physics and Book 5 of the Metaphysics. Aristotle holds that there are four causes of things in the material world. The material, the formal, the final, and the efficient cause. The material cause of a thing is just the stuff of which that thing is made. The formal cause is the form or shape that the stuff takes. The final cause is the purpose for which the thing exists, and the efficient cause is the antecedent condition or conditions that put the stuff in a form for a purpose. Consider this marble bust of Socrates. If we encounter this material effect in the world, we would naturally ask, why does this thing exist? For Aristotle, there are four different answers to that question. First, this is a bust of Socrates because of the marble it is made from. This is the material cause of the thing. After all, if it were made of bronze, it would be a different thing. But the marble doesn't tell the whole story. It's not just in any form. The marble is in the form of Socrates. This is the formal cause. But how did the marble get into the form of Socrates? This is the efficient cause, the sculptor who took the marble and put it into the form of Socrates. But why did the sculpture do this? That's the final cause, the purpose of making the bust in the first place. And in the case of the statue of Socrates in the Agora of Athens, it was to remind the Athenians not to go around killing philosophers just because they piss you off. So, according to Aristotle, to understand why something is what it is, we must understand the stuff of which it's made, the form the stuff takes, the reason the stuff is in the particular form, and the agency by which the stuff took a form for a purpose. It is the last of these, the efficient cause, that is the focus of Thomas's second argument for God's existence. Now we can see more clearly what the first premise is stating. Every material event in the universe is preceded by an efficient cause. The second premise is also clear and should be true since causes precede their effects. An effect cannot exist prior to itself, so nothing can be the cause of itself. In other words, you can't be your own grandpa. The third premise is the same as the third premise in the first argument, and is an expression of Thomas's understanding of time. Since there can't be an infinite regression of cause and effect, we must arrive at a first cause, and this is just what we call God. Now, given that this argument shares the same structure as the first argument, the objections that we noted above are also going to apply here. It would seem that, once again, we have a conflation of the number one and the idea of being first. Also, as objected earlier, if we imagine time as being infinite in both directions, or if we were to imagine a non-linear model of time, then there's no reason to believe that we can't have an infinite regression. We also see the same problem in the conclusion. Thomas is concluding a singular efficient cause when there's really nothing in the premises that would require us to do so. After all, you had two efficient causes, and the universe is a much more complex thing than you are, so why can't it have multiple causes? So we see all of the same objections here as we did in the argument from motion. But there's a further objection we can make that's unique to this argument, 
This a posteriori argument rests on our observations of cause and effect in the material world. Every material effect is preceded by a cause. But our observation also tells us that those causes are themselves material events, which means that they, in turn, must be preceded by causes, and so on. At each moment of causation, we find a material cause for a material effect. But notice that our conclusion tells us, supposing that we can get around all the other objections, that God is the first efficient cause. Is God a material entity? Thomas would certainly not think so. But that leaves a huge problem for the argument. How can a non-material thing be an efficient cause of a material effect? It would seem that Thomas must either conclude that God is a material being, which he's not going to be willing to do, or he owes us an explanation of how non-material things can cause material effects. We should note that such a thing may in fact be possible, but since we don't yet have observations to confirm such relationships, nor a theory of how they could occur, the conclusion of the argument doesn't follow from the premises. So much for the first two arguments. Let's turn our attention now to the argument from contingency. This is the most famous of Thomas's arguments, and when people think of the cosmological argument, this is the one they're normally thinking about. It's a fascinating argument, so let's see if it fares better than the first two. We begin with the observation that there are things in the universe that are contingent. You should recall from our investigation of the ontological argument that contingency is the so-called mode of existence that applies to changeable things, which includes, of course, changes in their existence. If something comes into or goes out of existence, or if it changes its properties, it is said to be a contingent kind of thing. When we observe the universe around us, we find that it's full of these kinds of things, things that can exist or do exist, but don't have to exist. That brings us to the second premise, which makes explicit one part of contingency, temporality. Things that come and go in time, or change in time, are contingent things. For each and every contingent thing, there are times that it exists, and there are times when it does not exist. Now, imagine the set of all of those contingent things. If they all fail at some time, then there must have been a time when none of them existed. But if there were such a time, how can anything exist now? After all, you can't get something from nothing. So, if there were a time when nothing existed, there wouldn't be anything in existence now. But there is! Just look! Our senses confirm the existence of all kinds of contingent things. So Thomas concludes that there must be something that is not contingent. There must be something that is necessary to account for all the contingency. Now, the next part of the argument rests on a distinction between two different kinds of necessity. Thus far, when we've used the word necessary, we've been referring to absolute necessity, or things which exist without the possibility of change. But Thomas is going to introduce us to a second form of necessity, which, for lack of a better term, we'll call material necessity. Now, to understand this second form of necessity, necessary things that are caused, let's consider the following example. I exist. But there's certainly nothing about me, in myself, that is necessary. So I'm a contingent being. Most notably, I was caused by my parents. My existence is dependent on their existence. So in a way, we can think of my parents as being necessary, given the material fact that I exist. But when we consider my parents, we discover that they, too, are contingent upon the existence of their parents. Considered in themselves, my parents are contingent because their existence is dependent upon the existence of my grandparents. But if we consider my grandparents in themselves, we find that they're not necessary either, at least not in the absolute sense. In fact, by the time I was born, two of them didn't exist anymore, and as of today, None of my grandparents exist, nor does my father. They are all 
definitely not necessary beings. But what is necessary is the fact that they existed. In a sense, they are necessary in so far as I exist. My material existence creates the necessary condition of their existence. With this in mind, we can now go back and pick up the argument. Premise 6 identifies the difference between necessary things that are subject to causation, or things that are materially necessary, but not absolutely necessary. Premise 7 tells us that there can't be an infinite regression of material necessity. Hence, there must be at least one absolute necessity, which gives rise to material necessity as well as contingency in the universe, and this is God. Now, as we review the argument, again, assuming it to be valid, we can easily approve of premise 1 since it is obvious to our senses that things do in fact come and go. Similarly, it is clear that not everything that is contingent exists all of the time. Contingent things are temporally limited. That brings us to premise 3. Why would this have to be true? Even if all contingent things fail to exist at some time, it doesn't follow that they would all have to fail to exist at the same time. So long as there was at least one contingent thing that existed at every time, then this premise would be false. So it is conceivable that there was a time when there was nothing, but we have no evidence that there was a time when there was nothing. And let's suppose that there actually was. Wouldn't time be an existent thing, even if there wasn't anything else? If we say no, then there must be a contingent thing in order for there to be time, and then we're back to the first objection. So long as there's at least one contingent thing at each moment, there wouldn't be a time when there was nothing. So there are clearly some serious problems with premise 3. Now, when it comes to premise 4, it looks like we're probably okay. You can't get something from nothing. And premise 5 also appears to be alright, because clearly there are things that do, in fact, exist now. But given the questions surrounding the third premise, we don't have to grant the conclusion of the first half of the argument. When we turn to the second part of the argument, premise 6 seems to be okay, but premise 7 brings us back to the same set of objections that we raised to this very same claim in the first two arguments. Given that, we don't have to grant the second conclusion of the argument either. Even if this argument doesn't work the way Thomas envisioned it, there does seem to be something interesting in the idea that we can't get something from nothing. It might be possible to rework the argument to conclude that the universe itself is necessary, even if all the material facts in it are contingent. This might be an argument for pantheism, for example. But certainly, it doesn't give us theism, which wants to establish the existence of God as distinct from the universe. So, none of Thomas's arguments seem to work as well as he had hoped. And we're going to skip the last two arguments, because the fourth argument, the argument from excellence, is almost universally thought to fail, and it's really just plain weird, as probably you picked up on while you were reading it. The argument from harmony is a version of the teleological argument, and we're going to look at a much more famous, and indeed better version of that argument, given by William Paley in our next video. So, in summary, we can say that St. Thomas's arguments for God's existence are rooted in the philosophy of Aristotle and are part of the great synthesis that he attempted in the Summa Theologica. Each of the arguments is rooted in observations of the world, so we classify them as a posteriori rather than a priori, like Anselm's ontological argument. This is also the reason we can label them cosmological, each argument begins with some observation of the cosmos, of the universe, and attempts to use that observation to prove the existence of God. Of all of the arguments, the argument from contingency is the most well-known and perhaps the most interesting of the five. But 
As we found, there are indeed significant objections that can be raised concerning the truth of the premises of the argument. So even if the arguments turn out to be valid, they don't appear to be sound. That's all for now. Join us next time when we look at William Paley's version of the teleological argument for God's existence as we continue to explore a little bit of philosophy.